John Key, interview one, take one. We should have John introduce where we are and the atmosphere and the vibe and the blow, you know, just the whole thing. So John Key, I don't even know where we should say you're based. I'm based in Brooklyn. Okay, we can say that. Yeah, based in Brooklyn. I would say I'm based in Brooklyn and Margate. We can say that. Maybe that sounds cute. Where are we and why are we here, John? We are in lovely Margate in the TKE studios, um, in the beautiful main gallery space, this rainy day. Rainy summer day. Rainy summer day. But I wanted to, you know, one of the things that we should definitely make clear, this is not, you're not like in a residency at the moment. This, you have a studio here at this location in Margate that you come and use when you're inspired to want to come out to the UK. Exactly. I have a full-time studio here. I come to Margate a few times a year, stay for a few weeks. And yeah, it's like my studio away from my studio. So how does that work? Like, do you... You know, this seems, I mean, it is a little bougie, but how do it's you- It's a little bougie. It's a little bougie. <laughs> how do you end up with a studio in, uh, you know, halfway across the world? How convenient is that? <laughs> I mean, it's like going, you know, we live in New York, so it's like, oh, I'm going to New York, I'm going to LA, which I was by coastal for a while that way, going to San Francisco. And this is literally the same amount of time to go the opposite direction and kind of be by coastal and, and Margate. But how do I even end up here? So I work with the gallery, Call Freeman Gallery, up the hill, and I've been working with them for a few, couple of years at this point. Yeah, and so Tracy was saying that she was opening this this school, she was opening the studio space, and we did a tour when it was like still under construction, and I was like, I want a studio here. And it was also kind of obvious too that Tracy wanted me to have a studio here. She was like being like, kind of like, oh, let me show you around, let me make, like she really, like she loves that we love Margay, and. I, I think she's always just trying to find and figure out reasons just to bring interesting people here. And yes, we saw the studio and we were like, we want a space. So Jared and I share it. So when I'm here, I use it. When Jared's here, they use it. Quick context, is Jared? Jared is my twin, yeah. So I have a twin also. They're also an artist. They are work with 1969 Gallery in New York. Very different practice as well. Very different practice. Jared's practice is based in performance and my practice is based in design at least kind of conceptually. So so that's what we ended up here. I guess as the other fellow American on this podcast, what do you what do you like about the UK? Like what is it that kind of draws you here and you you found it I know you have a gallery here, but is there something about the culture? Is there something about the city? Is there something about the country as a whole that you just are enjoying at the moment? Yeah, I think for me, I would say it's maybe less even about the country or even like London. I really just love Margate. Like, it's just because of the community, the vibe, the people. It's nice being in a small town and walking around and like, people know who you are. Like, people say, hey, on the street, people stop you. People want to like, oh, this is going to glass some wine right now. I finished catching up. You know, it's just like a small town pace of life. And then of course, there's the beautiful beach and the beautiful sunset. And every single time I come to Margate, like once I get out of the train or get out of the car, my like, shoulders relax, my jaw releases tension, and it's just a very chill environment. And it's filled with creative, so. How does this compare to Seal, Alabama? Seal, Alabama. So yeah, I'm from Seal, Alabama, and it is very different. So, I mean, where I'm from is even smaller. Um, I think we probably only had like 2,000 people in our town. and we Wow. That's small. Super small. That's a that's legit small like, town in America. Tiny. I feel I feel slightly less bad for not knowing Seal, Alabama now. Because I was like, oh, okay, is this one of those times I'm like supposed to know? No, you don't have to know it. No one knows it. I think even <laughs> if you were in the UK, you could name Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, and uh, Montgomery. We'd be like, pretty good, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should be able to You should be able to name Birmingham, though, at least, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those are the big cities, right? And so, yeah, Sill like is like a, a like very rural. Like I grew up like on lots of land, acres around me, and horses and cows and chickens and all of that. So, um, yeah, it's com- completely different. It's not the same at all. Maybe articulate a little bit about how growing up in small town America, small town Southern America, uh, how maybe you got into the arts or like what the first kind of like. Uh, how you came face to face with the arts because I think 
anyone who listens who's in Alabama might be like, how do I get, you know, how do I get to New York? How do I get to LA? How do I get to San Francisco? How do I get to Margate? Talk about like your first beginnings in the arts. Yeah. So my mom would set up an arts and crafts table for my twin and myself when we were younger. And so that's where we like would first experiment, you know, with paint and glitter and all of this stuff. And then we started making like home videos with our camcorders and we're like seven and eight. And then we were very into like singing in the church choir and doing pageants at church and at school. And that turned into doing recorder in the first grade and saxophone and trumpet and piano. And then I turned into theater classes and theater camp and all of these different things. So I just feel like at a really early age, we were really exposed to so many different types of arts. And our my mom was really supportive and put us in these, these programs and really allowed us to kind of play around with that. Um, and I guess for me, it kind of made me realize like in high school that, you know, there's a million ways that you can express yourself and tell your story through the arts. Like I was doing theater, I was still doing band, I was still doing choir in high school. And then I was flipping through this book that was um, the SCAD college perspective, like the, like the like college book. And so I was flipping through it, I was like, oh, like, what is this? Da, 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 da. And I saw a graphic design section. And I had been secretly doing graphic design the entire time. Like when I was 10 years old, my mom brought home an HTML coding book that one of her coworkers gave her. And she was like, oh, your sons are smart. Like they would like this. And I fucking loved coding. Like at a t- as a 10-year-old, I was like trying to figure it out, making little websites. And then that translated to me also kind of learning painting at the same time and just like playing with like the digital and the design, but also with the analog and the oil painting and yeah, when I saw this thing in SCAD, I was like, well, these are all the things I'm already doing. Like, I didn't even know there was a such thing as like graphic design. I was like, I didn't even know there were like art schools that you could go and do that. Um, so I ran down to my high school art teacher, Sally Bradley, and I was like, I want to be an artist. <laughs> Shout out Sally Bradley. Sally Bradley, helping me be here, you know, today for sure. And she was super supportive because I didn't have time. Like I was so busy with all of my other band and music and theater stuff. So basically my first art class that we had to take, I did it one-on-one after school with her. And she was really patient. And she just like allowed me to kind of skip a lot of the prerequisites by just working with her. And she also recommended me to go to like the summer SCAD seminar program, which was like a one week summer loan program at SCAD. And my parents were like, oh, like, you can go, but we're not going to pay for that. And so I ended up getting, like I applied and getting a full scholarship to go to this week long program. And then the following summer, like kind of doing the AP art stuff, my teacher also recommended me go to SCAT, I mean, go to RISD for pre-college for six weeks. And similarly, my parents were like, we're not going to pay, you know, thousands of dollars to send you to Rhode Island to go. Right. And now you're not just, you're not just going to Georgia. Now you're going all the way up to Rhode Island. It's like- going the furthest I had been by myself at that moment, like literally the fur- furthest away from home. And anyways, I got a full scholarship to go there too. I got, they paid for my supplies. They paid for my housing. They paid for my everything. And I think that my parents were like, oh, like people keep like giving you money to do this art thing. Like maybe this is, you know, something that you can actually do. Like maybe this isn't going to be like, a waste of time. <laughs> so when they were pushing this creativity, you know, or not necessarily pushing on you, but helping nurture it, um, was that just to help develop you and the creative side of you? Or, but was it still like, but at some point you're going to get a real job? Exactly. Yeah, I think because like doing the theater, doing the acting, doing the like all those kind of things, like just allows you to be able to communicate better, just allows you to be comfortable in front of a room, just allows you to be able to stand up and know who you are as a person. And so I feel like a lot of that was, at least from my mom's perspective, was definitely trying to make sure we're well-rounded, adjusted kids that could really go out and do anything and have the skills to do it. Um, but never imagined us actually being a full-time artist. Well, it'd be difficult for a parent to be like, well, you know where this is going to lead? Shows around the world in a studio in Margate. Like, it's just, it would be difficult just for- Just a big picture of Margate on the bedroom yeah, wall. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because it would be, it would be like slightly irresponsible to put that pressure because it is really difficult to get to where you are now. It's not, it's not a given just because you're creative when you're younger. You have to really hone that skill. You have to really kind of push yourself and you have to kind of find your group of people that you want to do it with. So good parenting. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I really thought I was going to be a psychiatrist, like in high school. you got school. a coach. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, this is the couch for it. <laughs> but John, are you not? 
I mean, or am I not? I feel like I am. I was actually talking to my mom like a couple of weeks ago as we're on the phone and she was like, I just don't know what I was thinking. Like, of course you were going to be artists. Like every single thing that you did growing up was like leading you to do this. And I think that was a really nice kind of revelation for her just to realize like, you know, it has been like this lifelong pursuit and it has been like a passion for the both of us for forever. And, you know, my dad runs a construction company and in some ways it's kind of like an art form in terms of like, there's a plot of land and then you like make a beautiful house, you know? And I think there's a lot of things that's interesting there. And my mom had these sketchbooks growing up and we like saw her sketchbooks of her drawings and she's so good at drawing. And so I kind of feel like- It was inevitable. Yeah, I think so. Did they, did your parents know that perhaps you and your sibling would support each other too in your creative endeavors? Well, we had one rule growing up is that Jared and I were the only siblings that we had and we had to be best friends. Like we had to support each other. We had to depend on each other. Like we had nobody else but each other. And our, and our parents made that really, really clear. Like from so a just super, the two of you? It's just the two of us, yeah. So, and they made that super clear at an early age. So, and, it's, and obviously it's still super nice now that whenever we're doing something, either like, you know, having a show in San Francisco or whatever, or like, carrying a box down the street, you know, like you could have someone to like help you do it or be there to support you. Was it, was it a conscious de de decision to try and find your own voice then and try and be independent of your sibling or was it ever an issue? No, I mean, I think, I mean, we're twins, but I think that Jared and I always had different interests going up. Like Jared has always been way more into music, like way more into singing, way more into piano, way more like amazing flute player, like all these things. And Jared was like really into like learning languages and being like really nerdy in that sense while I was like being really nerdy on the computer, like coding. So I think we both had our like various kind of like visual or like mental pathways that really informed you know, what we cared about and what we wanted to do. And still does. Like, Jared is writing an opera and is, you know, creating all this custom music and does these hair painting performances and is, like, making these scores. And so still using all of these, you know, skills that we started, he started, they started, you know, learning when they were younger. Is it competitive between you? So it's not competitive. I think it's really... I was going to ask that. I think it's a really good... Yeah, yeah. A lot of people ask us this. What's the Christmas table like if you celebrate Christmas? Like, what, is it like, you know, oh, I hear I hear you did the opera. Well, I had two shows. <laughs> no, it's so not like that at all. It's more like, I mean, it's, it's just like, I mean, I feel really blessed and lucky that it's not competitive. It's very supportive. And it's very like, how can I help you be better? How can you help me be better? How can we actually give each other critical feedback about our work and great opinions about the work? But also, you know, I think for us, it's just, we really just want to see each other just be the best versions of ourselves. And especially like, you know, growing up in Alabama in our households, like some days it really did feel like we only had each other and I, in, in kind of some of the chaos that was going on. So yeah, I think it isn't competitive. It's more like, well, if I'm killing it, I want you to kill it too, you know? And it was always like that. You yeah. didn't have to like learn that. You no. didn't have to, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, w I would have just been like, no, I used to be, we used to kill each other and then through therapy, we managed to learn how to do that. That's kind of the answer I was half expecting. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, no. It was just, it's actually been really supportive and chill and actually like, you know, like your best friend, you know, along the way. Church was a big part of your your experience creatively. Is that something that still factors in? You know, Southern Southern Black Church. Like, how, where where's the connection in Margate? Have you found that same <laughs> that same group of people that are able to nurture that? Is it is it still something that that, that helps uh, shape and inform your practice in any way? I think that's a good question. I mean, I don't go to church, but I think the idea of community and the idea of spirituality and the idea like you know the black church obviously is like a space of worship but it's also you know family it's like checking in with people it's about making sure people are doing okay su supply supplying support or food or whatever and so in some ways i mean in some ways i do feel like there is like this kind of tight-knit community of people in margate that 
I guess like now that you mentioned it kind of is that like church community fulfills that same kind of thing because it wasn't necessarily strictly going for the you know the connection to god or anything like that it was more for that sense to the people around you exactly and i think you know in my work i think there are these moments and themes of southernness or religion or family or kind of these you know, structural things that definitely a form who I am as a person. Like if I didn't go to the black Southern church in Alabama, like would I be a different person? And at some points, like maybe perhaps definitely in some ways, you know? So, and I still think all of those kind of stories show up in the work that I do in some ways. Does the idea of the ritual of going to church play into the ritual of going to the studio and the, and the, the dedication and kind of, kind of keeping with some sort of routine, ritualistic routine in a different way. Interesting. I mean, I have never thought about it that way, but I definitely think like when I go to my studio, for example, in New York or even here, you know, it's like, thank God I have this space. Thank God I can go in here and like do this work and it's quiet and it's like really me, you know, focusing on everything, you know, what I want to make, what I care about, like just having that moment of reflection, having that moment of like manifesting in the studio and like, you know, making work and being like, I want this to do this. I want these things out of this. I want, you know, and I feel like there is something kind of like church-like about that. That's interesting. Well, like we never asked this question, but because it's a podcast and no one can see it. I mean, you have to listen to it. We're standing, you know, we're sitting with a painting of yours behind you. What is your work? What is my work? So my work focuses on the various intersections of my identity and using kind of a limited color palette and using motifs and themes from my own personal memories. Um, it creates my work. So for example, like I paint with the color red, which for me means like family and bloodline and ancestry and legacy. I paint with the color green because I grew up in a bucolic, verdant, like, form, you know, in Alabama, I used to color black for blackness, my community, my race, my, my people. And then queerness is violet, which is, you know, I like this color because purple and red or blue and red makes purple. Whereas violet actually is its own color. It exists as its own light spectrum. It comes out of the ground as violet. So it's like this color that's outside of this binary. And I think about that a lot in terms of how I think about my own queerness. And it's not trying to be more masculine or feminine or all these things is really like I'm this own being. I have my own spe like presence and space and autonomy and agency. And then I use like these patterns, like for example, the polka dots, like my grandmother's nickname was, my mom's mom's nickname was polka dot. And so that shows up a lot in my work. And my dad would wear these kind of construction, I call them uniforms to work where it was like plaid kind of checkerboard, you know, designs on his shirt. So that translates into my kind of checkerboard patterns. And I think, again, having this matriarch and the patriarch and having these two sides in my family, obviously these two sides in my family like make up who I am as a person and allowing that to kind of come to life in the work, you know, as kind of a foundation for this visual language. I think it's really fun and powerful and interesting and abstracts it, but somehow kind of keeps it on the nose. But so all of the work, you know, kind of regardless of what I'm working on, like sometimes I'm talking about myself, sometimes like this painting, I'm talking about queer figures through history. Um, there still is this personal kind of connection and in, in the work. Is there like a historical connection to this color choice and their, their histories? Or is this something that you just kind of like quietly just crafted for yourself? I think it's a bit of both. So a lot of my practice is inspired by writing. So I do a lot of writing before I do a show or I do a painting or, and even before I was doing any of this work, I was doing a lot of writing in college. And when I moved to New York, I revisit this writing and added more to it and created more stories. And some of them, of course, like purple, violet is like a color of royalty. It's an expensive color, you know? And I feel like that's an undeniable in terms of like the research of that. But also I think it's amazing that that color obviously has so many different connotations, but as like a queer kind of person, queer black person, 
kind of elevating me and my community to these places of, you know, royalty or importance and feeling expensive and all those things I think is interesting. Is that connected then to the fabrics and this kind of choice of fashion and this particular, almost this time period that you're crafting for yourself? So, well, this work, this particular painting is of um, William Dorsey Swan, who was the quote, first black drag queen, not even the first black drag queen, the first drag queen of America, allegedly, in quotes. Yeah, is, is this just kind of covering your back, just in case someone in the comments goes, no, it fucking wasn't. <laughs> Let's start with that, though. It's exactly. a good place to start. Yeah, it's in quotes. And so basically there was a newspaper clipping that was written in 1880 in Washington, D.C. that said the queen was raided and basically was a newspaper article that ha was like, you know, her party that she was throwing, these balls that she was throwing was raided by the police. And that kind of was the first time that someone kind of in a newspaper printed like drag queen or queens or like this kind of thing. So anyways, so what she's wearing is like very typical of what she would be wearing during that time period, kind of like these more lavish ball gowns. And so, yeah, so I've been doing, I'm like working on a book project right now where I've been researching queer figures throughout history, starting from the 1800s. So are you trying to do the like the B-sides, you know, like step away from the ones that we know already? Exactly. And, you know, and going through the, again, because my practice is based in design, but going through the kind of print ephemera and going to the archives and looking at newspaper clippings and lithographs and finding these stories about how Black queer people were written about before we had our own autonomy agency to like put those stories into print for ourselves, but also just even knowing like, who they are. So for example, there's another woman that I painted, which is called Mary Jones. And she, again, in quotes, was like the first black trans woman in New York, which is ridiculous because it's obviously not true, but she was the first to maybe document it, you know, like she- The, the first one that claimed it. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, she was went to court, you know, and she had to go and stand and basically say like, I am, my name is Peter Sawali, but I go by Mary Jones and actually document and record in New York history, like the voice of a black trans person. And what, what year would this have been? Keep that would have been 1836. Yes. And so she was born in 1805, approximately okay. moved okay. from New Louisiana, New Orleans to New York. And what's also really interesting about her is that there was a lithograph that was made by H.R. Robinson, this guy who basically, you know, created this poster of her that said the man monster. And so it's kind of, the man monster. And so again, there's like this fascination with the black queer body and kind of a, repost, a repulsion um, to it. But also in some newspaper clippings, they would be like, oh my God, Mary Jones would always be wearing the most fashionable hat. She always had the most fashionable dress on. She looked amazing, but she's also like, you know, a man and a monster. She's going to deceive you. And so it's like this very kind of complex, interesting history of like, the visual language of what does it mean to be trans or queer or black or all of these different things. And, and you could see them just totally not understanding their own feelings and their own sensibilities and how they felt towards it. Exactly. I mean, sometimes I'm like, you loved her. Like you loved her. Like the public you was obsessed. <laughs> yeah. It was 18, you know, 1836. So in New York. Walk me through this as a ch kind of chicken or the egg moment here is, are you doing research and then writing based on your research or are you writing something and then within that writing that you come up with, you find a topic that you want to research? Yeah, I mean, so the writing that I was doing before that I initially started, all of the writing was personal. So it was all kind of reflecting my own personal experiences. Like that writing got me to like these four pillars that I care about in my work, the blackness, the southernness, the queerness, the family. And then as I've kind of continued to write and even have questions like, well, who came before me? What was the other kind of design queer artifacts that existed? Who were the trans people? Like you see photographs of people, like who are these people? You know, and, and then that then allows me to say, okay, let me go to the archives. Let me find other names. Let me find other photographs. Let me find other language. And so it is like a going back and forth, you know, it is kind of like personal and then the research and the personal and then the research and the personal. And then somehow it comes together and it's output it in, you know, paintings. What is something that is a misconception about the South that maybe people like myself who grew up in the North would not have right? Hmm. I would say all the rumors are true. 
That's what I always say. I mean, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of love in the South, way more love than you experience on a daily basis, like walking down the street in New York. Like, I feel like it comes to the community. It comes from like this kind of Southern hospitality that I think which is, is real, which is, is a very super real, real thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it, like someone can, you know, literally be racist but would be cordial to you like in a store, you know, like it's like this weird balance of like always kind of presenting pretty friendly. Like I would say most people are really friendly. And then they would say like Southern Express, like, oh, bless your heart, all these things that kind of are shady, but also kind of presented in like a nice way. So yeah, I don't know. Do you find that more, which, which is easier to navigate? The ones that are cold and direct and they don't give you the time unless you've earned it or the ones that are all very friendly, but actually underneath the, the mask, they're, they're not in the nicest. Yeah, I feel very New York. Like I've, I definitely identify with necessi- like not necessarily having to always perform this kind of overly gracious hospitality and allowing to be real with real people, you know, and also not having to also recognize people. Like, I love that about New York. Like, you can be invisible, you can stand out, you can, you know, talk to people in the street. You don't have to, like, there is like, you don't have to do this whole, like, open the doors and be like, you don't have to do all those things. And no one is like offended if you don't, like, oh, this person is just living their life. There's know? something beautiful about being invisible. Yeah, it's something beautiful about being like, I'm by myself, you know, and then, of course, like, every, like we know, like there is community in New York, like it's, you know, it's sometimes too small of a community in New York. So yeah. When was the first time you saw yourself represented through an artwork of any kind, be it, you know, music, visual arts or something like that? I love this question. That's a good question, Doug. Yeah. I love this question. Um, <clears throat> so for, <laughs> I didn't even know that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say. I guess something that was really pivotal, I don't know if this is maybe the first time, but the really pivotal moment was the 10th Magazine, which is a black, queer, fashion and lifestyle magazine that was founded in 2014, 2013. Oh, so fairly new. So it's right. pretty new. Yeah. And it was founded by Kari Sepp and Andre Vernon and Kyle Banks. And it's based in New York. And I was just moved to New York out of graphic design school. And I was on Facebook and I saw this ad that said, black, gay, unbothered, order today. And I was like, what is this? And then I clicked on it and it was a magazine. And I was like, a magazine about black gay people? Like, what is this? And so I ordered it. And when I got it in the mail, like a couple of days later, I was flipping through it so slowly. And like, I got halfway through the book and I was sobbing. Like, it was the first time that I had ever seen like, a magazine that had like beautiful images of black queer people, written by black queer people, high art directions, super fashion, all like the brands, all the things. And I was like, it was for me, you know? And so of course I like closed the magazine, I emailed them immediately and I was like, what is this? This is amazing. I wanna work with you guys. Let me help you, let me do anything. And so, and I have been working with them ever since. So, um, and so yeah, I mean, that was really, kind of amazing and from that whole process of working with the 10th magazine that whole gang of guys and women and people um you know I was able to meet like all these amazing black animators and illustrators and writers and fashion people and so suddenly in New York my community of like black queer creatives that I was so desperately searching for that I did not have in undergrad was there you know it's funny because I, I I'm as a you know, as a as a straight white guy, I, the labels and things like that aren't things that we have grown up with. Like these are these, we, you know, it's by our default. The world is is made by the default of of you know the ancestors and things like that. So we don't question these things. And then the more I start to learn about and have my worldview opened up, and we learn about the power of labels and things like that. And just seeing a magazine that said, are you black and queer? And it's like, there's nothing else identifying. Not about like, are you into this? Are you literally, are you just black and queer? And those labels it, were enough to pull you in and get you to the point where you were physically moved. And it just kind of shows like the validity of, of those ter- that terminology and what it can achieve, you know? Absolutely. And, be, and at that moment, there really weren't 
that many kind of like cool magazines, print publications that were that nuanced and that focus and that well produced. And that was like trying to produce something every three months, you know, that was like a serious thing. And now, I've, now that I've kind of been researching and interviewing a lot of people and like now I'm finding these kind of examples that were made in the 90s, that were made in the 80s, that were made in the 70s, that were critical for even the Tim to exist. But it's not like you don't learn about these things. Like you don't learn about these things in school. You don't learn about these things in graphic design class. You don't see these kind of representations of these types of stories in a beautiful, highly well-designed way that validate the complete essence of who you are. Do you ever, sorry, just I'm going to jump into this one then. Do you ever find the counter to that where because you identify as a black queer artist that you are expected to make a particular type of art that follows a particular narrative? There is like, you know, I think now like the language I think has gotten way more nuanced around queerness and blackness and all these things in a way that in 20, the early 2010s, it really wasn't as much. When I first started doing the work and when I first kind of got into this thing, it was like, I was doing this to be visible, you know, to try to find other people that look like me. But I think to your point, sometimes other people will pigeonhole you into, you know, oh, well, this, this is what you're only supposed to talk about. And, and, and in relation to the wider art world, you know, those, the, you know, the powers that be within that, do you find that they, usher you down a direction you know particularly if they're crafting a bio or they're writing a press release or something like that yeah i mean this is the problem with you know the art world in general i think that like you're a woman artist you're a black artist you're an indigenous artist you're like you know but we're all really just artists and we're telling our stories from our various perspectives our histories and you know like you were saying earlier like the white straight man doesn't have to like qualify i've never read a press release in a you know from a, a white straight artist saying opening up with he's a white straight artist like well, well we assumed right we assumed <laughs> exactly so i mean and so i think that is a problem with the art world because i mean all, of course all of us want to just exist and be seen as just amazing artists without any of the asterisks or any of the unnecessary language around it the kind of nuances of identity like diversity and inclusion and equity and all of these things. I think where that came from was desperation, right? Because we people were just silent. So were you silenced or silent? We, the people were being silenced. And now it's kind of like, well, we also can talk about other things. You know, we also can do other things. There are also, even in my work, like, I'm not talking about like black queer history. I'm talking about American history. And I think there is a, a, a nuance of that uh, and recognizing that like America's a melting pot and it is all of these different kind of identities and people who come together that create it to be this amazing thing. And without all of these amazing different people in this space, it would not be America. It would not be, would not have the same history. I think that people are doing this, but I, I am hoping that on a larger level that we can like I want to be able to make work about what I want to make about make it about, and I want people to be like, "Wow, great painting, John." Is the UK or England in particular? Are they in on this conversation as well? Are they? Is it? Is there a progressive conversation going on here? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I would say maybe around because we're here, we should talk. Yeah, about, we're yeah. here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Here. I yeah. think because you know, around the people I surround myself with, we're having these conversations, and I think that. You know, I think the larger art world is still also having these conversations. And I think it's not like happening all so fast, but I think it will continue to get better and shift and change. And and I don't know. <laughs> By the time you leave Margate, leave the studio, do you think we'd be sitting in front of a, you know, we're looking at something that's so very definitely American do you think we'll start to see that English black history, black British history filtering through into the subject matter? Yeah, like is the work changing as you Very say, as interesting you question. I think it is a little bit actually. I think the work is changing. And I think for me, especially like I mean, what I've been doing the past few weeks being here is literally drawing landscapes, drawing flowers, drawing like scenes of the beach. He's drawing. getting his hawk neon. Yeah, no, but this is a Turner thing, isn't it? This is like, exactly, this is exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I mean, I, and, I, and I think that's really interesting of like allowing myself as a person, as an artist to be able to 
feel confident and comfortable just painting the things that are just beautiful, you know, and to paint the things where I am now. And I mean, there is something interesting about Margate. Like, for example, Margate obviously is a port town, so they obviously would ship slaves here. And so in the middle of the bay, there is actually a sunken slave ship, which is very interesting and kind of, I mean, in some ways, I think it's kind of cool. Like, you know, just like this idea that there is this artifact here that reminds this community of what the history is. That nobody knows about it. And nobody really knows about it. And yeah. And so there's an amazing group called People Dim Collective that's based here in Margate that are basically creating a, you know, community center slash kind of museum on the beachfront talking about all of these things and talking about the kind of legacy of slavery and things here. And I don't know. So I think there is like this kind of interesting thing. Like when I first came to Margate, like I didn't really expect to hang out with black people. <laughs> you know, I didn't expect to be able to know that there would actually be this kind of really intense, like powerful, you know, activist community and community that's really about sharing this this history and this these stories here. So, you know, so I think there's a lot of work, you know. And there, there, there's something really energized in the in that community down here. And it's really, it's it's great to hear that it's not just, you know, oh, like there's a black community. It's not just there's a black community. There's an active black community who are really digging in and caring about and following up on this legacy and this history because you can't, but like, you can't just leave it to fucking white guys to sit and figure it out because they, they're like, they, they're not going to do it. Right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. I mean, it's pretty interesting. And, and so that's what I've been doing here. I mean, I really have been trying to slow down and like allow myself to, you know, Turner, like you said, mentioned, like Turner would come here and paint all the seascapes, all these amazing paintings here in front of the, the bay. And, and every single day I have to see the sunset. Like if I don't see the sunset, I'm like actually sad. They're fucking, there's something else down here. They really, they're like, they, there's, I mean, I've seen sunsets all over the world, but there's something about these ones here. It's just, it's different. It is. It's honestly glorious. I can't explain this. I don't know. I can't explain it. Wait a minute. So I come here on the one day that it's gray, like the last couple of weeks, I'm not going to see the sunset. I feel really sad for you. <laughs> I mean, now I feel sad for myself based on what you guys just were talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, but, what? I don't know. It might, it might come out later. But the th so this is um, something that is, it's not just, about getting away and having a different studio it's it's about almost refocusing a little bit the way you look at the world and the way you look at yourself as an artist that's it seems like quite exciting i think so and i mean and i think that's why it's kind of nice to have a studio that's outside of the new york kind of chaos and kind of like the whole thing that you're always kind of dealing with on a daily basis i think it's nice to sometimes just like change your whole environment and go to new places and learn new things and see new flowers and see new colors and see new textures and the light hits things differently and people talk about things differently and people call things different names here and just just allowing all of that to allow me to just just make new things does it remind you about when you first moved to new york and there was an excitement and a buzz like do you feel it is it is a different kind of excitement you're you're an older man now it's a whole different you know like does it remind does it does it remind you of a of a change? I love that question because it kind of I me. Mean, I always say that like Bushwick and Margate feel really similar, especially when I moved to Bushwick in 2013, like 2012, 2013. It kind of has like all the artists are moving here. It's really kind of reasonable. Like there's, you know, this community of people making. There's, you know, it's kind of nice some places, some places kind of sketchy, some places, you know. And so I like that kind of like, yeah, like you can just go in and kind of carve your own little space here before everything gets too congealed and too who's the tracy emin of bushwick who's the tracy emin of bushwick <laughs> i have no idea i'm not even i have no idea i'm not even going to even begin to try to answer that thank you i just want to get that one <laughs> in Dude, who do you think it's tracy emin yeah of who do you think it is i live in manhattan i don't know man right i mean that's very interesting actually no and i was just wondering because like there are like you know pivotal figures who kind of help the, you know, the community, there's a community of people going to a certain area already. And then kind of Tracy being from Mar Margate, being such a pivotal figure in the contemporary art world, like her coming back here and doing something, it's like, it's a big deal. And that kind of like reshapes the way we think about a place that was already happening and artists were already coming here. It's kind of curious, if like, you know, I can't remember of anyone like in New York doing that, but I'm curious about that. I mean, I guess like when we first moved to New York, there was like, especially in Bushwick at this time, there was like so many like arts collectives that were 
coming up, like I used to run an arts collective, co-founded an arts collective with a bunch of my friends who went to Brown. And, um, and then it's like Yellow Jackets. Arts. I mean, there's so many arts collectives that were just happening then. And I feel like that to me was kind of a very cool thing because I think that people were taking responsibility for their own building and people were taking responsibility for their own community engagement and like just trying to like, again, be different than Manhattan. Like we, we wanted to say, well, let's show the trans people, let's show the women, let's show the people of color, let's show the, you know, all of these people that maybe don't necessarily get shown or especially in 2013, you don't get shown as much in those kind of gallery spaces. So and I, I feel like there is like this kind of collective zeitgeist or energy that I think everyone who's just like coming from college in like 2010, 2011, 2012, you know, after the recession, after all these things, I think people were just kind of looking for spaces to build. And they're looking for their tribe as well. You know, they want to find the people to share that experience with and help collectively do something with, you know? Exactly. You can do nothing by yourself. Like, you can literally do nothing by yourself in New York. I mean, anywhere, but especially New York. Particularly sure. in New York. Yeah. yeah. And and there's that smaller energy here where it is, it's, it's so small in comparison, you know, it's less overwhelming, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, I just love it here. <laughs> well, we, we've talked about this on the podcast before, though, like so many artists don't realize that we we talk about artists in terms of movements and like as groups we don't necessarily talk about artists as individuals who just like you know went through history by themselves painting by themselves with no other like contemporaries and i think a lot of like artists when they're younger you, i think the advice is always like find the group of people you want to come up with because that's actually how everything's going to be nurtured how we're going to talk about it i think that's always something that's really important it seems like it's happening here absolutely i mean if it wasn't for our arts collective was called codify art and I mean, if it wasn't for Codify Art, like we all had our first shows because of Codify Art. You know, we did, we had house shows and have house parties and we'd put up shows in our house and invite 200 people over. And then that slowly transitioned to us having like our first kind of arts collective show together in New York and Bushwick and then, you know, all of these different, and then we did Spring Break Art Fair in New York as an arts collective. And so, and then that's where like, you know, my work was first seen by Kathy Grayson and all these people. And so I think it was like, if it wasn't for us committing to ourselves and committing to just the act of making, the act of building, the act of showing, like, I don't know where we would be. I guess that's a, we haven't even talked about it. You, you, look, you, you're having a, you're a very, you're a successful artist right now. Everything's going really well. And like people love Said right work. now. <laughs> right. No, no. I, don't, I just don't, I don't want to jinx them. <laughs> you're going to be great for, you, I think you're going to be great forever. Right. I don't oh, want no, to, no, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not trying to jinx him. <laughs> Motherfuckers, both of you. Where was, what was like kind of the, that, that sort of break for you where um, some of these uh, really great contemporary curators and art or in galleries were noticing your work like what was kind of the break yeah i mean the break for me was i mean was spring break art fair like we it was our first show that we curated that was like a big art fair like i don't know spring break art fair is kind of the independent art fair so you could be independent curators you could be independent arts collectives you could be an artist and you present projects and so we presented a project that was called standard standard um which is double standard cute and it was just like all of our friends. <laughs> it really was good. And like, it was really good. And like, we had Martin Gutierrez, who was now this, like this amazing artist. I mean, she was amazing then, but she's an amazing artist that has shown at the um, Whitney Biennale. She showed at the Whitney Biennale. She showed at the Venice Biennale. She's killing it. So, we like, this was before all of that. We showed like just a bunch of our friends. And I think that was really cool because you know we had two thousand people come into our room you know over that course of that you know weekend or whatever and so like those people were like kathy grayson those people were like you know other kind of amazing collectors and people started sharing things on social media and then like people say like, it was just like this weird thing and i had a conversation with kathy actually and she i was like wow like this is just crazy that like you like she shared my work on instagram and like people like kind of started to care you know and then I sold all my workout from that show. And I had like three paintings. I had only made three paintings ever and they all sold. And it was kind of like, what's going on? And then the following year we did Spring Break again and like Nita, uh, Chanel Abney bought a work. And like, you know, and so it's just like, and I started meeting other galleries. So it was like this kind of crazy, almost definitely not overnight, but definitely like 
we were, I just feel like I was like suddenly visible, you know?